Welcome back to the Solid Verbal Boys and Girls. My name is Ty Hildenbrandt, that fine gentleman over there, as always, heart of the Midwest, still the incomparable Dan Rubenstein. Sir, welcome back to the pod. How goes it, my friend? It goes especially well today, Ty, and I want to issue a disclaimer right at the top. Uh, our thoughts and prayers and condolences are to everybody who has been affected by natural disasters, <laughs> geological disasters. Uh, we don't mean to make light of the violence and casualty that volcanoes have brought upon this world, but also a good amount of beauty that volcanoes have brought to this world in terms of land formations and the way that, uh, the, the world has been sort of carved out by volcanic activity. Um, we are stupid, silly people. And that is why we are pursuing this direction for the show. We are. <laughs> is that so, a good enough disclaimer intro? Yeah, that, that was handed down by the solid verbal legal team. Dan. Yeah, you, of course. You delivered yes. it masterfully. Thank you. Today's a very special episode. We've been building to this quite literally for the last month, month and a half or so. Yeah. You can see behind me if you're watching. On the video, you will certainly hear some of the sounds that we put together for this monstrosity of an episode as we go through the next hour or so. We built a model volcano. You did. I did. Collectively, you approved it. Yeah. We built it. We put our heads together. It is a National Geographic branded, not a sponsor, could be age eight and up, 18 inch high model volcano. And boy, did you clear that bar. I cleared the bar. This yeah. thing is huge. It does not fit on the shelf behind me. I had to bring a tray table downstairs to seat it next to me. Um, the official name for the volcano is something we are calling Takatoa. Yes. And our initial idea for this thing was that throughout the course of the 2024 season, however long we go before the, the smoke substance, the compound that we're burning, in order to create the, the smoke college effect. football tephra, if you will. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. However long this thing goes before it is melted by that compound, <laughs> we are going to be feeding it our hottest, most controversial takes throughout the course of the year into the mouth of the volcano. Yeah. We're just going to throw them in there. At some point, there will be an eruption that occurs. I don't know when that will happen. Yeah. Um, but we're going to go back through the takes. So we're going to keep track of all these dumb things we say and the dumb things that people send in to us. Maybe they're not dumb. Maybe they actually happen. That's why they're hot takes. Well, we're going to have to sort of discover which take it is that is thick and viscous enough to to sort of set up that explosion at the end of the season. Because, of course, as we all know and didn't just learn this morning, um, the biggest explosions come from the thickest magma because that stores the gas in there for a long time. And is so this, at some point... Is this Nat Geo approved, what you're telling me right now? Did you do the research? I, I looked at no fewer than like uh, volcano, like seven volcanoes for school children <laughs> websites. Perfect. perfect. Um, yeah, so it's going to be the, the thickest, most gaseous flow of magma that sets off this. So if, if somebody is able to have a take, that ultimately comes true by the end of the year. That's that's the thickness of of the take that will explode this volcano, that'll erupt it. The, yeah. There was some internal discord yeah. over what we named this thing. Mm -hmm. And I think where we finally came down on the matter was, we'll call it Take Atoa because that sounds official. We're going to be feeding our takes into it. But internally, we started referring to this guy behind me as Jason Pierre Paul Kano. Yeah, I always appreciated that. Yeah. And just like more shorthand, just the Paul Kano. Yeah. Or Paul. Right. So it's going to be a recurring character on this on this here. We podcast. could technically we could get like a Tennessee logo, a Miami logo and an Oregon logo because that's your Vol Kane. Oh, yeah. Oh, OK. That's not bad, right? That's I don't know. That's just bad. for decor, but continue. Hey, sorry for the quick interruption, but it'd be incredible if you considered subscribing to the Solid Verbal YouTube channel right down below. Anyway, you can see it behind me. And what we're going to do is erupt this thing. You can also see the smoke now coming up if you're watching the video. Yeah. Um, we're going to erupt this thing <laughs> at some point in the future. But for the meantime, obviously, the smoke coming out of the volcano is due to the just 
incredibly fiery takes that will be fed into it, if that yeah, makes so sense. Yeah, so what you're saying is, sure, other podcasts, other college football podcasts add human hosts, human co-hosts to the fold. What right. we're doing is adding a paper mache natural disaster as That's the exactly. third co-host <laughs> of the show. And so, sure, you could listen to a podcast that breathlessly debates the best coaches in college football in March, or they could be like, we're doing over-unders, six and a half for Minnesota. What's your take? No, 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 no. We're out here building science projects. We have a show. science project. Find I made... yourself a college football podcast that takes content to the driveway so it doesn't stain the carpet. I made a incredible mess putting this thing together, and I cleaned it up before Kate could find it. Yeah. Great. There are Smart. still gigantic clumps of the plaster compound that they send me that are hidden in my dining room yeah. that need to be cleaned up. <laughs> so this was full bit commitment, as we say on the show. Yeah. Hit subscribe, hit follow, go out to verballers.com. We're going to post some behind the scenes footage of uh, not just, well, we posted footage of me spray painting and putting this guy together, but there's a new one that's going to drop shortly after we record this that shows me feeding up the smoke mechanism, Yes, um, which I'm not certain isn't going to trigger the fire alarms. I don't know if there's any kind of hazmat situation for me breathing it in. Mm -hmm. And also because there is no ventilation in my home studio, I've got a fan in the other room that is sort of at least like wafting this out of here, hopefully so that it does not like build up on the equipment. Yeah, what I don't happened know to what's the solid verbal? What happened to Ty? Uh, poisoned himself, <laughs> gave himself pretty gnarly throat conditions via a goof involving a, we'll say it, a sentient speaking. Yes, I'm growing warm with your takes. <laughs> Volcano. <laughs> it's this quite the, the dumbest, way for this show to wrap up. This is the dumbest thing we've ever done. Okay, let, let's get into it. Let's get into it. So uh, give me another sound, please, for Paul. Stand back, here comes the lava. Save yourself. Save yourself. Let's start with one of your takes that I jotted down yeah. about a month ago. And this take was extremely hot. I don't think unreasonable. You We're think trying so? to Oh, I don't think it's unreasonable. And it's I do think hot. it's hot though. <laughs> it's a hot take. What we've done, by the way, in addition to ones that you and I have to add to this volcano, um, we've also added to our list some that came in via Twitter from the Verballer Hood and others that came in via Verballers.com out on Patreon. So we're spreading the love here. It's not just going to be takes from Dan and I, but really throughout the Verballer Hood. Your take back on February the 26th was Kansas State's going to be a top 10 team yes. in 2024. Uh, we said at that point in time, we would add it to the volcano. The volcano is currently smoking, Dan. Mm -hmm. Why do you feel this way about Kansas State? And why did we feel like this is something we should add to the volcano to start with? I can't remember that far back, but <laughs> <laughs> I wrote it down. I know. I remember saying it. Uh, it's star power quarterback. It's that the upside of Avery Johnson, a.k.a. Avery Johnson, um, is enough uh, coupled with what will be an easier schedule in the Big 12, as well as Kansas State has played in recent years against both Oklahoma and Texas, not having them on the schedule. It's, I think, September 14th, they've got a matchup against Arizona, which right. should, it appears to be one of the better national quarterback matchups of the season, if we're to believe in the folk hero ness of Avery Johnson and the emergence of skill players around him. Uh, which was sort of the issue last year with Will Howard that, you know, the, the fall off with Deuce Vaughn and Malik Knowles was significant in Will Howard's development as a top tier national quarterback. We'll see if that works out for him at Ohio State. But Avery Johnson seems to be sort of more do it all and uh, turns a third and seven that looks like it's doomed into first and 10 after 14 yards that that sort of star power coupled with a more interesting Big 12, because I don't think we have a good read on who's actually going to emerge, but I, I tend to lean on folk hero ceilings, and that's what I feel about Avery Johnson, and certainly what I feel about Noah Fafita, which once again, I think perhaps a Big 12 top 10 ranking goes through Tucson on September 14th, and so right now I'm going to wager on Chris Kleiman over Brent Brennan, given the experience with their rosters. I think that's fair. I mean... Kansas State is not among the highest 
in Bill C's returning production index, at least right. not on offense. They've got a lot back on defense, but offensively, you know, will Howard leaves quarterback and defense, Avery Johnson yeah. and an experienced defense. And I think you can make some hay in the new big 12. That's going to be a recurring theme for us. So, uh, we jotted this one down. That's why it goes into the Paul Kano, take a toe whatever you want to call it. I think um, it's like a VEI one or two, by the way, the volcanic volcanic explosivity index. Mm -hmm, of course. Um, Eight is the the largest that has I think it was like seventy five thousand years ago. Um, but eight is the largest, but it can keep going up from there. But yeah, it's a one or two. They won the Big Twelve not that long ago. So this this is basically just like a grumble in the stomach, is what this is. Yeah, there's some ash. Might get might get a little bit of volcanic ash coming out. Might get a little bit of smoke, but maybe yeah. not full full uh, throated lava flow. Sure, correct. Do you have one that's a little bit hotter for me, Dan? I do. Um, I was looking across the, the college football universe, and uh, I think I'm, I'm, I, I hesitate with Mizzou. The schedule is pretty great. You know, everybody's going to sort of start penciling in Alabama as more gettable, not necessarily a win, but considering the changes with no Nick Saban. So I was leaning Mizzou, uh, and then I went back on that. Um, I don't. In terms of what I have here, like, I think Texas has a really good shot to win the SEC. I don't know how hot that is, though. Mm. I, I honestly think we need. I think we need a little bit more spice. We're gonna throw this in the. Volcano. I think so too. Um, I have the Kansas State one, ACC one. How about this? Pitt's gonna win nine games this what? year. <laughs> Pitt's gonna win nine. Oh, ho, ho. Feed me the tanks. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, we discussed Pitt recently. Their schedule is such that they're not going to sleepwalk to nine, but there's enough new. And uh, I believe does Pitt miss Florida State? Yes, they miss Florida State, which honestly, all things considered, like I don't think DJU Florida State is going to be Jordan Travis Florida State. Uh, schedule's great, right? It's a road game at North Carolina. No Drake May. Um, it's a road game at SMU. Does not have an ACC roster, at least not yet. It's at Louisville near the end of the season. Tyler Shuck making it to the end of the year would be kind of new and novel for the Tyler Shuck experience. All due respect at Cincinnati early on at Boston College with a year one coach sort of later on in the process. Like, I don't know if Pitt can get its act together. If Nate Yarnell is the guy like he kind of showed himself to be near the end of last year and the new offensive coordinator works out like. They're not going to sleepwalk to nine, but it's there for the taking. Pitt's going to win nine in this new look ACC. We, we posted a video out on social media, and it was our reaction to the ESPN list that came out, the top 10 quarterbacks, right? We did an episode on yeah. that as well, and we had somebody chime in. You got to put Yarny in there. Got to put Yarny in there, which I think is, I'm assuming is a reference to Nate Yarnell. Yeah. I love the nickname. I don't know about loving nine games for Pitt, where they came from. Yeah, why this not? Is, this is a serious investment in the magic of Pat Narduzzi. Mm -hmm. I've got one for myself. Okay. Yes, I'm growing warm with your takes. Doomed. doomed. I've got Jalen Milrow will not finish the 24th season as Alabama's starting quarterback. Wow. He, he seems like he could go in one of two dramatic ways, right? Under the tutelage of this new coaching staff. Now, no Ryan Grubb, but Kalen DeBoer almost exclusively succeeds with quarterbacks. You look at Jalen Milrow, needs more development in terms of... What kind know, of quarterbacks, though? What kind of quarterbacks? Because he had, obviously, a very good run with Michael Penix Jr. Yeah. Um, in, his, in his limited time at Fresno, it was like guys that pass a little bit more. I feel like his system, and we talked about this before on the show, his system is kind of like a more modern pro style version of the air raid. That's a system that he likes to run. Yeah. And I, I believe in Kalen DeBoer, the guys won everywhere he's been. And certainly the comments that have come out from Jalen Milrow as as he has mentioned in published media reports, there were others that wanted to pluck him away from Tuscaloosa. He opted to stay. 
He's excited about the system that he has seen from Kalen DeBoer thus far. He's committed to learning it and blah, 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 all the good stuff, right? Mm -hmm. They say all the right stuff. And uh, Jalen Moreau for sure grew a lot as a quarterback last season. But I, I, I come back to this notion that's kind of bouncing around in the back of my mind, which is the system that we've seen DeBoer run everywhere is not really compatible with Jalen Moreau. It just isn't. He needs, he needs an accurate passer. Yeah. He needs somebody that can do a little bit more through the air than Milrow can. Now, Milrow, the system that they developed over the course of the year last year was he's a threat to run. He's still not necessarily a running quarterback, still prefers to be in the pocket, but they started utilizing his speed a lot more. And they used that to great effect. They used their ground game to great effect because when a defense would commit too much to the line or to him, that's when he would hit you over the top. Right. And so maybe DeBoer will adapt his system to the personnel on hand. I got to believe on some level, if you're any successful college football coach, you know how to do that. And he has proven his merit Mm -hmm. throughout the course of his stops from, you know, Washington back to the NAIA days, right? He's a very, very skilled coach, but there is also talent behind Jalen Milrow. Some of it came with Kalen DeBoer from Washington. Yeah, Austin Mack, yeah. And I am very, very curious and apprehensive about what Milrow looks like in that DeBoer system. So again, look, it's the middle of March, Dan. Yeah. A lot of these takes are not necessarily going to be the most informed and most educated version of their future self. Yeah. You could be argued that most of my takes in mid-October are not as fully formed as they clearly, should be. Continue. Clearly. Yeah. yeah. But in the interest of feeding, just getting take a toe is started and fed and watered and hungry and ready for the season ahead. Jalen Milrow will not finish the 24 seasons Alabama started. Yeah, I don't mind it. Obviously, Kalen DeBoer didn't recruit Jalen Milrow to Alabama. I, the, the only issue I take with it, I appreciate the, the, the heat in this take because Jalen Milrow at his best last year was uh, worthy of being a Heisman finalist type player, of course. So I appreciate the heat of this. My only pushback is... Michael Penix and Jake Hayner could not do athletically what Jalen Milrow can do. It's a luxury to have this ability. Is he as developed and as finished a product as a passer as Michael Penix? Absolutely not. Not even close. But not even close. How did Michael Penix get there? How did Jake Hayner get there? They had Kalen DeBoer. So that true. to me is true. the difference maker. Not your boy Tommy Reese, not Bill O'Brien, <laughs> who Alabama fans don't look back on super fondly, who he himself said Jalen Milrow is not a quarterback and I think he's a relatively bright football mind. Um, so maybe that comes to pass, no pun intended. Um, but if you're trying to give a quarterback the best chance to succeed, stability, talent around him, we'll see if this offensive line improves, of course, down his left tackles, starting center. Um, we'll see if the offensive line can come together a little bit better than it did last year over the course of the year. See if his receivers develop. There should be talent there once again. So he has the opportunity to grow under Kalen DeBoer in a way that perhaps he didn't under Tommy Reese or Bill O'Brien. So that to me is the case for him thriving, but certainly some of those down moments and the, some of the, the more raw aspects of his game, I, I think, lead to your line of thinking, which I don't think is crazy. We, we did have some folks out on social media because we put a call out there to get some of these takes, which we'll get into now. Yeah. We had some folks chime in and say that Actually, Alabama's coaching staff has been upgraded. Has been upgraded. Okay. I mean that is that is that is a scalding hot take. That may be its own volcano. <laughs> I don't think a staff can be upgraded from being led by Nick Saban. Yeah. I don't think that's, a that's hot take. possible. And I also don't know how we would measure that. Wins. I don't know how we would measure that because if we're looking at this in terms of, you know very scientific volcanic one through eight or eight above whatever the thing is called that you mentioned before yeah we need some way to quantify this and i don't know how we grade that out at the end of the year but appreciate the candor appreciate it i mean look if if alabama's offense looks more like it looked like a few years ago to a mac jones ish that's all time all time productivity then you can say from last year specifically, it's an upgrade. Those offenses had receivers that were so obviously of NFL caliber in the way that Washington's were last year. It doesn't seem like Alabama's receiving room is currently there at the moment. So hard to see, but 
Open to it, Ty. Open to it. Open to it. All right. Give me a sound, please. Stand back. Here comes the lava. Yeah. Save yourself. This one is from our friend Andy Staples. He was on the show back February the 7th. His take was that Tyler Shuck will be this year's Michael Penix Jr. I remember that. This was a take. I jotted this down, and this was actually, I think, the take that gave us this idea or started us down the path of creating a model volcano into which we can cast these fiery takes. Um, Tyler Shuck is now at Louisville. He has transferred out of Texas Tech. He is joining forces with Jeff Brom, who did a good job with Jack Plummer last year. Louisville very much is a program, I think, on the rise. I think they have done a really, really good job. Again, combining the high school recruiting with the transfer portal stuff. Mm -hmm. It's been a mix. He has done a really good job. Only one year of sample that we can go off of, but Louisville obviously had a pretty good season last year. So it stands to reason that you put Tyler Shuck into that system with a quarterback guy in Jeff Brom on a team that's got a lot of talent around him, probably more so, definitely more so than Texas Tech. Stands to reason that Tyler Shuck, if he stays healthy, could have a big year. People have been on Tyler Shuck for a good long time now. Yeah, well, you it's know, at least from, what his sixth year playing college football. Yeah, it's it's preposterous how long some of these guys have been around at this point. Mm -hmm. But uh, this felt like a really hot take that needed to go into the volcano if and when we put it together. Now that we have Andy, congratulations, Tyler Shuck. Your Tyler Shuck take is now inside the mouth of Takeatoa. Okay. Tyler Shuck's career thus far, cleanup duty in 2019 as a backup at Oregon, started kind of bench near the end of the year when you look at the Pac-12 championship game and the bowl game against Iowa State in 2020, obviously a shortened year, but played in all seven games. Uh, 2021, four games for Texas Tech. 2022, seven games for Texas Tech. 2023, four games for Texas Tech. So he may very well look like the 2024 Michael Penix in September with a good quarterback coach in, um, uh, what's it, Jeff Brom. Uh, but I, I think a lot is discounted with just how much was back for Washington last year for Michael Penix and the last couple of years for Michael Penix, you know, Chris Peterson did a great job of recruiting that roster. Um, certainly Kalen DeBoer brings in Michael Penix, but like Tyler Shuck as like, ready to explode. I think that the fact that he's old is a good case for it. Yeah, the fact that he's I paired agree. with Jeff Brom is a good case for it, but I, I don't think there is going to be a this year's Michael Penix. I, I, I just, uh, unless it's somebody, look, if it's Dylan Gabriel, somebody like that, that they're entering into a situation with so much success and obvious receiving talent, um, I just don't see it with Tyler Shuck. I, I understand the like comparison with like injured a bunch like Michael Penix was at Indiana with his season ending injuries and has this last final opportunity. But I thought we saw it with Michael Penix at Indiana. You know, we saw flashes of it, like the the game breaking ability, you know, in the the Penn State game, the Ohio State game. I just don't think we've seen it with Tyler Shuck in that same way that we saw those flashes with Michael Penix. I appreciate the take though. I appreciate the take. I, I, I like where he's coming from. I am excited about the fact that we can start using September Penix yeah. as a term on this show. Yeah. Septenix. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm good with a, a fast, interesting start. I don't know who's at the top of Louisville's schedule. Is there opportunity to sort of jump into the Heisman frying pan early on? Well, I mean... The thing about Louisville's schedule is it starts off in a really, really advantageous way, and it is spread out, I think, appropriately so. Okay. They don't have any murderer's rows or wounder's rows, as we tend right. to talk about on this episode. Start out the year, Austin P, Jacksonville State, a bye week, Georgia Tech, and then on the road at Notre Dame. So end of September, you've got that road tilt at Notre Dame. That will obviously be prime time. Say it will be in the public eye in some way, right? That'll be one of the big matchups for that week. Middle to end of October, home game against Miami. That is also what I would estimate at this point in time is going to be a, a pretty big matchup. And then to start off 
the month of November, they're on the road at Clemson, which is also going to be a pretty big matchup. So it's spread out in a really nice way. They close out the year, obviously, at Kentucky for the Governor's Cup. But, you know, it's it's not one of those deals for Louisville where they're looking at this and they're going to be playing just back-to-back-to-back bangers like Florida. We've talked about with the Florida schedule. So it's set up pretty well for them, provided Shuck can stay healthy and they can get into an early rhythm. They're going to have a pretty good case um, for a big time matchup at the end of September on the road at Notre Dame, that could be a potential coming out party for him. Yeah, you're not wrong. And look, you look at the the supposed powers in the ACC, and everybody seems vulnerable in their own specific way. I'm ready for a reemergence of the ACC as like a dangerous conference, and I okay. think it's happening this year. All right, so here, let me let's fire this up. Give me a sound, yeah. please. Oh, ho, ho. Feed me the takes. Feed me the takes. We've got Connor. We've got Hokey Pokey. Okay. On Twitter. To your point of the ACC being a more interesting conference, I need to get rid of this smoke. I don't know if this is going to like <laughs> give me black lung or I'm hot boxing. You're gonna. They're gonna be a. There's gonna be a commercial that like if you've been affected by the National Geographic paper mache <laughs> volcano. You may be eligible. You may be entitled to a serious cash reward. This is a portable smoke machine that I paid $32 on Amazon for. And you're in an unventilated basement at the moment. It's completely unventilated right now. So this may trigger the fire alarms. This is a Virginia Tech take that I love. Connor says that Virginia Tech's playing for the ACC title. Pokey Polky says that Virginia Tech will compete for a playoff spot. Kind of one in the same. Mm Mm-hmm. Kind of one in the same. Now, before you outright dismiss this take, it is definitely hot. Yeah. Thank you, Connor. Thank you, Hokey Pokey out on Twitter. Virginia Tech is currently number one in Bill Connolly's returning production metric. We got a lot coming back. The schedule, we've talked about the schedule on this show, right? The schedule is quite advantageous for the Virginia Tech Hokies. Here is what we are talking about. We are talking about a road matchup end of September at Miami. That's their first, I guess, projected to be ranked opponent. Right. We're talking about a matchup at home start of November against Clemson. Clemson will also be ranked. And then a bunch of teams in between that don't necessarily scare you. At Vandy, home against Marshall, at Old Dominion, home against Rutgers, at Stanford, home against Boston College, home against Georgia Tech, on the road at Syracuse, on the road at Duke, home against Virginia for the Commonwealth Cup to close things out end of November. Right. I'm not saying, but I'm saying that's a very advantageous schedule. And provided provided they could get more out of the offense and Kyron Jones, provided they can continue to sort of do some good work on the defensive side of the ball, you could, you could at least squint and make the case that Virginia Tech is in the running for that. You could, right? Uh, I think so. I Look, there's a stretch on that Virginia Tech schedule as you read it off. I was like, so they've got Haynes King, Kyle McCord, Cade Klubnick, Malik Murphy. Mm. You could talk me into those quarterbacks being full-on good, full-on really good, full-on up and down. Like, that... That feels like a pretty dangerous stretch. I know. I think Virginia Tech had a really good pass rush last year, so hopefully that continues with their their returning production. Don't have the exact names in front of me at this moment. Virginia Tech's going to feel like a sexy team to get on board with this sexy. year, with the way that they came on the back half of last year. Uh, I I think it's too soon. I'd pump the brakes on Virginia Tech a little bit, um, but. I can appreciate the enthusiasm given the momentum from last year and the bowl game, especially even as little as bowl games mean nowadays. I'm into the enthusiasm. I'm into the fire with Virginia Tech. I just hesitate a little bit because I don't think they have the depth. I don't think they have the star power at the moment when they lose their starting tight end. Like they lost some pieces still that were meaningful to Kyron Jones's development last year. So I'd pump the brakes on Virginia Tech if I'm looking at this pragmatically, but if I'm looking at this through the VEI lens, Ty, the Volcanic mm-hmm. Explosivity Index, yeah, I'm two or three here. Yeah, for sure. How about this one from Tyler on okay. Ballers.com? 
This one's got some flames coming off. Give me a sound, please. Uh, I don't know which ones I've played. Let's go with mm, this one. Stand back. Here comes the lava. That's a good one for this. I've played it. We played it like at least three times. Continue. I'm losing track. Yeah. But take a Toa. Take a Toa is keeping track. <laughs> Tyler on Verballers.com says Chip Kelly. Chip Kelly will be the interim head coach for Ohio State. I love State this one. This is a, this is a four point two in terms of the VEI. Yeah, Tyler completed the assignment and passed with flying colors. So the the implication here is that something goes south for Ryan Day, and therefore Chip Kelly will be the interim coach going into Ohio State's bowl game. Is it fair to assume that based on this take? He is also saying that Ohio State misses out on the playoff. Yeah, if he's simply saying bowl and not playoff, yes. That is a fiery take. So let's let's talk through what this would actually look like in reality because Ohio State's been loading up, right? The narrative has been Ohio State's quote-unquote going for it right? this year. In order for Ohio State to fall short of whatever it is going for, you have to assume they lose to Oregon. Middle of October, that's a, a road tilt. Have to assume they probably lose to Michigan or Penn State. Those games are a little bit later in the year in the month of November. Right. And there's probably, you know, a, a third loss in there somewhere. I don't know if it's coming at home against Iowa. I don't know if it's coming on the road at Michigan State. My problem with this take could be at home against Nebraska. Maybe Dylan I was going to say, that's a sandwich is, game, right? That's a letdown look ahead. A little bit. There's a bye week in there as well. There's, there's after Oregon. There's a bye week before Nebraska, uh, and then Nebraska comes before Penn State. Yeah, but you have to, you have to really twist yourself in knots here to find where three or four losses are coming from on the Ohio State side of things. That is essentially what Tyler is saying with this take. That right. It bottoms out. Maybe there are injuries. Maybe I, you know, I have a really hard time getting myself to the point where I can believe this, but. As hot takes go, Tyler, mm -hmm. my namesake, beautiful job here with this. Beautiful job. Take yeah, a toa it, it is would, satiated by this. I think it would have to be a fourth loss. Not that Ryan Day won't be fired. I don't know. Obviously, you, you pour that much money into an NIL program uh, to bring back star power and to add star power in the portal via, you know, Caleb Downs and Quinshawn Judkins and Will Howard. Um, it's going to have to be something that's legit embarrassing. For not for Ryan Day to be fired once again, but that quickly, I suppose that it's before a bowl game, though you might as well get a jump on it anyway. If you're bringing in Chip Kelly as offensive coordinator, he certainly has the chops to be an interim head coach at a major place, maybe at Northwestern if they're playing yeah. that game in a oh weird like they're playing at Glenbrook North High School. <laughs> and it's another one of those. Remember when we had like the it's 70 mile an hour wins for CJ Stroud as he goes five of 17. You could yeah. have one of those games. You lose Northwestern on a weird field on top of losing to what Oregon and Michigan and Penn state. Um, yeah, that could spell doom for the Ryan day era, I suppose. But um, I, I don't know if they get destroyed by a non Harbaugh Michigan team. Like, it would it would be very odd to see an eleven and one coach fired before the bowl game. They'd be in the playoffs at eleven and one. So to yeah, for Ohio exactly. State to not be in the playoff, you're probably losing three. And I could see that being deeply embarrassing. Yeah, I, I think it's a two point eight on the VEI. If you lose three games if you're Ryan Day and the third is Michigan again for another year, it's not that far fetched. You could see it. Maybe he leaves on his own accord at that point. For what? I don't know. An NFL coordinator position. Something. Just so he has a down year. Oh, and oh, coordinator position. Okay. All right. Seems to be all the rage. Here's one. Oh, more takes. Why it burns. This one comes to us from Colin out on Twitter. I don't know if it's an eight on your scale. But I like this. I like this heat. Colin says South Florida will make the college football playoff in 2024. I like this. I like this I a good amount. This. So here, here's the deal. This is here's more the... smart and early than scalding hot. 
Yeah, but this is it's early enough that it feels hot and it's okay. It's also hot because they play Bama on the road like second week of the year. Remember, like That's fine. the South the South Florida game for Alabama. Oh, I forgot to turn the volcano on for that one. Please. Put that on. There's Sorry, that Colin. smoke. Sorry, Colin. That was my bad. Um, here's like the South Florida game for Bama last year was a pivotal moment. Remember? Yeah. They decide, all right, we're not starting Jalen Milrow. We're gonna give gonna give Tyler Buckner and Ty Simpson a chance. We'll see how that goes. And we we know how that went, right? We know full yeah, horrible. At this point yeah. how that went. But that kind of gave birth to this new version of I have to get rid of the smoke. <laughs> it just comes right back at me. Yeah. This gave birth to this new version of Jalen Milrow that we have seen since then and kind of this retooled offense that played more into, I think, what he is good at. Um, but South Florida's an interesting team. They not only got that Bama game on the road early part of September, they're also home versus Miami end of September, right? So they've got two very interesting high-level non-conference opponents in the month of September. They've got a quarterback who I think is really exciting, Byron Brown, mm -hmm. who threw for over 3,000 yards last season, ran for close to 1,000 yards in the regular season, had 11 touchdowns, so a dual-purpose guy somebody who can go out there and obviously take this offense to a really exciting place. They need to get better on offense. They need to get a lot better on defense, I think, to warrant them being a playoff team. But there's a case to be made that, okay, they beat one of those two teams in the non-conference. Most likely Miami. I don't think they're beating Bama, but who knows? Who knows what version of Bama we'll see? I mean, it's like a, a Boise State or recent Cincinnati type scheduling situation, even more so. Than Cincinnati. I think Cincinnati is what Notre Dame and Indiana That's when right. they went to the playoff. That's so right. So this is Alabama, Miami, which Miami isn't Miami, but still compared to the rest of the still. schedule. And, and, and again, it's Alabama, Miami, Tulane, Memphis in the the first half of the schedule. Consider just consider this about the take here from Colin. Okay. The way that the playoff is situated, there is going to be a non-power four team in the playoff. It is written into the bylaws of the damn system. There are 12 teams that get in. Whoever this team is from the non-power four, I guess we still call it group of five, group of seven. I don't even know what the hell it's called anymore. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But it is the highest ranked, in all likelihood, conference champion. Mm -hmm. And so you can lose. You can lose both of these games, frankly. And still find your way into the playoffs. Depends. I mean, look, if the Mountain West champion is 11 and 1, they're probably going to be ranked higher. It depends what South Florida looks like against the American, I guess, and what they look like against Alabama, Miami, if they take it to the, the gun or something. But it's still tough. It's, it's still tough, tough but, if they but, get blown out in those games. But here's the thing. Here, yeah. And the reason that I like this is because they've got a lot coming back, 17th in returning production. Mm hmm. They've got two teams on the schedule early. If they knock one of them off, clearly they're going to get a fair amount of acclaim in the polls. And they're in one of the better non-power conferences in the American, right? Yeah. Tulane has been making its hay. In but the year American. one coach, John Sumrall, yeah. Year one coach, um, like I, I think they're in a good spot to actually make this come true. And we know that they are committed to try and pour more into their football program. We talked about their stadium and how they're, mm -hmm. you know, floating bonds to do the stadium because they feel it's important. So they want to be in the playoff like most teams do, but it seems like there is a real commitment to get there. Uh, if not this year before long, they've got an exciting quarterback prospect, just need to improve the defense. Uh, Colin, I like the fire on this take. But there's this also, in just in terms, if you compare where South Florida is right now to the rest of the recent powers, either in the Mountain West or the American or the Sun Belt or wherever, there's a lot of change, right? James Madison loses its coach. San Diego State is starting over with a new coach. Boise yep. State is starting over with a new coach. Tulane is starting over with a new coach. So there is something that's sort of up in the air. And then you obviously add the have the Big 12 adding Cincinnati and BYU and UCF and Houston. like So... What constitutes a G5 power has changed. What the top of that universe looks like has changed, where there's not somebody that's, it seems, equally loaded with high-level expectations. Whatever you believe about, you know, whoever in the Mountain West, about Air Force, about 
you know, San Jose State starting over, San Diego State starting over, Fresno State kind of, but not really changing things, going back to Tedford, dealing with hell stuff. Like, there's a lot that is just able to be taken at the top of the G5 ranks right now. So why not South Florida? Why not South Florida? All right, here's another one. Yes, I'm growing warm with your takes. Doomed. College sports tonight via verballers.com. That's our Patreon. Add yeah. free episodes, bonus content, early access to this episode, all the ones that we put out throughout the offseason. This has a considerable amount of heat coming off it. I okay. don't want to read it right away, but this this is another gentleman or gentlewoman who passed the assignment. Colorado will start 0 and 3. Mm. Despite all the bravado around the program, Colorado will start 0 and 3. Now, we talked about Colorado a couple episodes ago. And I think the takeaway from our standpoint, the takeaway was they need to get through the early part of the schedule because it gets harder. The longer they go, it, it, it gets harder. Yeah. Moving into a new conference, maybe that's good, maybe that's not. We can debate the merits of that at some point. Colorado's first three games are North Dakota State. It's not a bad program. <laughs> Okay. North a lot Dakota new State. at North Dakota State. Sort Not of new. Continue. A lot new, but the pedigree is there. At Nebraska, which is number three in returning production, Nebraska is a big unknown right now. We had a bunch of takes that came in for Nebraska, yeah. frankly. That's one. And then the third is at Colorado State. Remember that game from a year ago? Of went to overtime. We were all up late. We were doing a live show yeah. while Travis the game Hunter was still gets going. hurt. Yeah. Travis Hunter gets hurt, right? So. There, there is a world in which this experiment at Colorado, despite the fact they have clearly some exciting pro caliber talent on that roster, there is a world in which the line doesn't get better, the defense doesn't get better, North Dakota State plays a good game, goes on the road to Boulder, pulls mm -hmm. off an upset, Nebraska at home, new quarterback, a lot of excitement around that program, hopefully they are better, they knock off Colorado, and then Colorado State gets even. There is a world in which that is possible, but an 0-3 Colorado start is about as hot as we can get, I think, here in early March. It feels like it's wish casting, though. It feels like bit, right? it, was, a bit. it was issued by somebody who just doesn't like Deion Sanders. <laughs> um, because North Dakota State's dynasty is over, right? South Dakota State has won the last two FCS championships. North Dakota State's head coach left after, I think, the quarterfinal matchup. Matt Entz to become the new linebackers coach, maybe a, an associate head coach or something for USC and Lincoln USC. Riley. Yep. Um, secondary took a step back last year for North Dakota State. Um, so they hire a new head coach, but he has a ton of experience in Fargo. He was most recently, I think, the Wyoming offensive coordinator, uh, new defensive coordinator. So there is some new. It's not like this is a machine, you know, with, you know, barnstorming and having its next stop in Boulder. This is not a North Dakota State machine, at least right now. So to say that, like, oh, it's North Dakota State, like, well, they're I think they lost to all of the Dakotas last year. Right. I, they they avenged one of those losses late, but I think they lost to North Dakota, South Dakota State and South Dakota. So take that off the table, at least for now. Colorado State is not as talented as Colorado. The the level of having Shador Sanders throwing to Travis Hunter is unmatched. Um, we'll see if the defense improves and make a change at defensive coordinator. There's a lot of new coaches in Boulder, Nebraska wise. I, where's this game this year? The game is at Nebraska. It's at Nebraska. It's still a true freshman quarterback for Nebraska. It's still a Colorado team that was able to generate a bunch of turnovers, get to Jeff Sims last year. I have no idea why anybody would think the Nebraska offensive line is going to be dramatically better. Now, maybe Colorado doesn't have the front to change that up, but Colorado's adding dudes. And so, yes, you can argue that the TCU win was at least partially due to TCU having no tape for game one on what Deion Sanders and the Sean Lewis offense were going to do last year. But I think it's kind of weird to think about Colorado being worse in year two. Like, yeah. if you're going to think about this sensically, they're going to be better with a full off season. you know, Deion knowing what kinds of players he wants to target to improve this team. So. Yes, Matt Rule is a better college football coach than Deion Sanders. He has proven a lot more. Be starting an offensive line that was terrible last year well, and, and a and true freshman quarterback, and they're going to be better immediately? 
I, I, I wanted that. to address that because we we did get a question from social media yeah. from someone who was who was wondering about that line comment that we made. Yeah. When we talk about Nebraska's offensive line, the numbers that we are honing in on, 123rd nationally in sacks per drop back. Yeah. They allowed pressure on 36.5% of their dropbacks, pressure rate. Yeah. 93rd in the nation. Which is not always on the line, right? Quarterbacks can not hold on to the, the ball line. too long. Yeah, yeah. Receivers can't get open. There are reasons. Not always on the line. Their yeah. standard down sack rate was 130th mm-hmm. in the nation. Again, some of that could be due to quarterback. Yeah. But then you look at things like offensive line stats. The offensive line, if you're just grading the offensive line, 103rd nationally, pressures allowed. 81st nationally, blown. Block, I mean, you could just blown, watch the games too to see that this is not a good percentage, line. Yeah. Total block percentage is that. So all of the line stats that we track would indicate that Nebraska's offensive line wasn't good. I don't think it's all on the line, but certainly those numbers don't do them any favors. And it right. is an and area where they need to improve. It's the new quarterback's uncle who's running the offensive line as well. That's right. That's right. All right, we got time for uh, a, a couple more here. Are there any right. that you want to grab off of this list? Yes, I'm growing warm <laughs> with your takes. Uh, the ACC won't exist by the end of the 2024-2025 <laughs> season for Max on Twitter. This this is like an eight, right? This, this is, is a, a six take. and a half. Yeah. This is, this is a... Because we a know the intention is there for teams to leave the ACC. And we already kind of understand that it's a thrown together mess of a conference in this moment by adding West Coast and Texas, a Texas team and two teams from the Bay Area. Um, so it's not on stable footing in terms of uh, enthusiasm by some of its current members, but at the same time, they're locked into a TV deal for a considerable amount of time that seems pretty ironclad. It seems pretty. Un- I I don't see the ACC bottoming out by the end of this year. I can see a world in which, I can see a world in which, um, we talk about Florida State not being part of the ACC, and I think Florida State leaving the ACC portends the future demise of the conference. Sure, I do think it'll be more of a slow rolling type of thing, and I think uh, the, I've really been focused on Florida State for a while with respect to conference realignment, because we had, we had talked to Brett McMurphy a year ago and he gave us some inkling that perhaps the Oregon Washington thing was coming, Mm -hmm. right? All they were waiting for was that invite from the big 10 and it was going to happen. And lo and behold, it did. But I have really been focused on Florida state because I think Florida state signals what could be a larger domino effect in college football. Because what happens if Florida state leaves the ACC if they figure out some way to tunnel under or hop over this grant of rights thing, and we know right now it's going to the courts, there, there is a world in which other schools look at that and say, well, we don't want to be here either. Now, maybe they don't pay the penalty up front because it's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and that's its own bit of calculus to figure out how to acquire that much money, dead money that you're going to pay in. But what else does it mean? Well, it means Notre Dame is probably not going to join the ACC long term. It right. means Notre Dame's looking at the ACC. I think that's kind of their Hail Mary, hoping that they can entice <laughs> Notre Dame to join the conference and therefore yeah. legitimize it. I don't think that's going to happen. I think Notre Dame is content where it's at. But if Florida State leaves, because Florida State perceives there is more money out there to be had um, either by joining the Big Ten, the SEC, or through some private equity world staying independent. That signals to Notre Dame, you don't want to join the ACC. Maybe it makes more sense to pursue your your big paycheck that you know is waiting for you if and when you decide the Big Ten. Right. That also signals to other schools that are in the ACC that it's time to start looking for the exits. It's time for Clemson, another athletic program that's pretty rich. I don't know if Clemson's got quite the national footprint they don't. that some of these other conferences would want in terms of you know trying to add on TV revenue and that type of thing, but... Clemson's got a lot of money in their athletic department, one of the richest out there. Maybe they start looking for the exits. Maybe other schools like North Carolina. We know North Carolina has been sought Yeah, North Carolina, there. Virginia, right. And there's all sorts of like states putting in bylaws about who can vote and not vote and who That's can right. prevent things from happening. Yeah. So I, I just, I think there is something of a domino effect that happens if Florida State, really any of these teams, but I think Florida State is the one that's been most outspoken about it. If they can figure out a way to get out of this thing, 
Um, I don't think it's by the end of 24, 25. Right. To Max's point. But I do think that it could set into motion more of a slow collapse that we see go down over the next three, four years. Yeah, I think it's pretty secure. I think the ACC is pretty secure. So this is this is a, a looking into the future, pretty seismic take um, because there's still the the tonnage of teams in the ACC that would stay, you know, band together that would band together here with, you know, it's you know a lot of people look at this conference as having a strength of basketball and obviously the college basketball uh, universe has changed, but you're still talking about Duke and Virginia and Louisville and Syracuse and like. Wake Forest, NC State, all Georgia Tech, like a lot of these places care deeply about sort of remaining in the same conference together and associating with one another. And so it's still a much, much bigger deal than like the American or the Mountain West or the Sun Belt or anything like that. So it would still be the ACC and maybe what it gets in terms of automatic qualifying for how many automatic teams it gets into the playoff or Whatever the considerations are for the conference's reputation, I still think you have to consider it a power conference. I, I, I don't see it happening. It would have to take something in the way of like something in the way of the Big Ten and the SEC bundling so much more aggressively, quick, more quickly than they have no. recently. I just don't see it. And you have a number of attractive teams, as you mentioned, right? Clemson, Florida State, North Carolina. Uh, I just don't see it, man. I mean, North, North Carolina is another one of those linchpin teams that I think is sought after by both the Big Ten and the mm -hmm. SEC. I don't think North Carolina has got the scratch to pay to get out of this thing. And I don't know if there's a desire from their standpoint to do so either. Um, but they're another school to watch. Yeah. If things really start to go sideways in the ACC, North Carolina is one of those teams to watch, as is Virginia, Virginia Tech. Sure. It, it's long been assumed that those two would sort of be handcuffed together and go into a new conference, yeah, whatever that is, as a unit. I don't know if that's true. We saw, obviously, Oregon, Oregon State didn't really go that way. Washington, Washington State, yeah. But uh, I appreciate this take, Max. I really do. We've got a couple more here. What do you have? I've got this one from Georgia is a verb out on verballers.com. Yeah. Billy Napier's tenure post UCF game. Look at this wish casting. The wish casting takes are hot out there. Will be measured in hours, not days. Yes. Yes. Feed me the takes. Ah! Real quick, if you like the video, please consider subscribing to the full podcast at solidverbal.com, Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. All the links are down below in the description. So here is what Georgia is a verb, what a name, is referring to when he references the post-UCF Florida schedule. Florida starts its season with Miami, Samford, Texas A&M, at Mississippi State, and then a bye. Mm-hmm. After that bye, they've got UCF at home in the swamp. After the UCF game, though, this is where we've been talking a lot about Florida's schedule. At Tennessee, home against Kentucky, another bye, and then they go into their murderer's row throughout the month of November. Georgia game in Jacksonville, right? Neutral cider. Yeah. At Texas, home against LSU. It's brutal. It's brutal. Home against... Ole Miss close out the year on the road at Florida State. So basically, Florida's got to win out in that early part of its schedule if they want to make a bowl game. Like they need to beat a team like a Miami. They need to beat a team like a Texas A&M, which is kind of rebuilding a little bit. They need yeah. to beat UCF if they want to go to a bowl game. UCF is maybe that key game on the entire schedule, even to get to six and six. Mm -hmm. So. The argument here is basically that they're losing to UCF. You'd have to lose to UCF, and they'd probably have to lose another game before you get to UCF that would cause Florida to kick out Billy Napier and put itself back on the market midway into the season. This one is a hot take. This one is a very reasonable take, given the state of affairs at Florida right now. Um, it does not, maybe it is a little bit of wish casting, as you alluded, 
but it does not signal a whole lot of confidence in the way that Napier is taking the program right now. Yeah, I mean, look, he was on the hot seat going into December. Um, it's uh, not that hot a take. <laughs> it's not that hot a take that Florida will it be looking spicy, at. It is spicy, though. It is it's spicy. spicy. I, I put it into the volcano. I, I, take a Toa is interested in this take, is feeding on this take because, no, it's not a hot take that Billy Napier would be fired. The specificity, though. Yeah, I like that. The, the specificity that on October the 6th, the day after UCF comes to Florida, potentially beats Florida, knocks them off, probably throws them um, uh, for a loop if they knock them off. Yeah. That that's when it would happen midway into the season. Yeah. Look, the, the momentum isn't great. You look at where the recruiting class was, and then there were some decommitments ahead of signing day. But Florida still secured DJ Lagway, who was considered to be, the, I think, the best quarterback in the 2024 class. Um, like a national player of the year type talent. So he is looked at as the next big thing in the sport at quarterback. And so you part ways with Billy Napier. And look, you always make the right move because long term it makes the most sense and you can't worry about who is or is not going to stay. But he's a pretty major domino if you make that move. So we'll see um, how trigger happy Florida will be mid-year and look at people behind the scenes at florida have already started vetting people knowing that this is a possibility to take over for billy napier but you run the risk of really driving the program into the ground um when you make a, a mid-season move so yeah it would it would have to be so absolutely necessary and have to be such an embarrassing loss to ucf that yeah, especially given like the internal Florida politics with these with the in-state schools and UCF saying Florida was scared to play and then Florida agrees to I think it's a two and one, right? Florida gets right. two home games in this series to UCF's one. Um that it would be terribly embarrassing for Florida to sort of big time this situation, the scheduling situation, and then lose at home in Gainesville. So yeah, I think it's three, three point two in terms of VEI. Yeah. Final take here, Dan. I've got a bonus take, by the way, that I think is like a 4-8. Continue. This one from Rev Millie OKC. OKC, a bit of a hint here. Okay. This is out on Verballers.com. As I am fanning away this <laughs> smoke, whatever this compound yeah. is. The Oklahoma Sooners will go 11-1. and one. LSU on the road is going to be their only loss. They will play Georgia in the SEC title game. Ooh. Oklahoma, Georgia. That is a hot take. Eh, I think it's warm. I think it's like a, a bubbling jacuzzi of a take. Oklahoma's recruited really well. I it's know. a new conference. The expectation is not to immediately, you know, thrash teams. New quarterback. Defense did improve last year. That was good. Defense improved. Defense improved, but line probably got worse on the on schedule. Offense. Yeah, Tennessee's on the schedule. Auburn on the road. Who knows what version of Auburn we'll see? Texas, the neutral site game, of course. Texas State Fair on the road at Ole Miss. On the road at Mizzou, Alabama, LSU. The aforementioned LSU game. There's a lot of heavy artillery on the schedule, man. Yeah, I. This feels very hot to me. It feels very hot to me. Well, it's just I'm not into it. The the reason why it feels hot is because the the take was just like Oklahoma goes eleven and one loses to LSU but ends up playing Georgia but there's no whoever submitted this didn't show their work like they didn't say the defense is going to be much improved because of this I think Mizzou's overrated because of this I think Ole Miss is overrated or gettable because of this like they didn't show their work see I think I think the hot take for this yeah is that Oklahoma goes seven and five. Okay, they take a step back. Yeah, yeah, because we we talked about it on a on a previous episode as well. Yeah, like one of the things that Oklahoma, one of the narratives that Oklahoma, I think, is going to be playing against the season is some within, you know, the Big Twelve, some maybe within the own fan base, their own fan base that say, ah, maybe this was a mistake. <laughs> maybe this was a mistake. Yeah. The schedule is going to get considerably harder. Yeah, the path is more difficult. Yeah. So, um, 
Do we want to include this in Take a Toe, or do we want to pull this one out? I would pull it out. I have one for you on similar grounds, though, in terms of a team taking a step back in a new conference. All right. Rev Millie, thank you for submitting that. Yes. Um, Take a Toa has ejected. Here, let me put some smoke on there. Take a Toa has ejected this take, but if you show your work and come back, we'll we'll reconsider this at some point in the future. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Give play, it to me. Play me a sound. Oh, more takes. Why it burns? USC is missing a bowl game this year. A bowl? A bowl missing game. A bowl. Oh, boy. Okay. okay. So, all right. The show reason USC has succeeded these past couple years has been the offense, namely having the most talented quarterback in the country, the biggest, the biggest time playmaker in Caleb Williams. Whatever you feel about Miller Moss, whatever you feel about Jade Mayava, it's going to be a drop off. Even if one of them is successful, it's going to be a drop off. I think the offensive line has gotten worse. I think star power at running back with now no Marshawn Lloyd off to the draft has gotten worse. Receiver has gotten worse since it was that pair of what Mario Williams and Jordan Addison. Mario Williams is now is he Tulane. I know he left um, and he's recruited well. Um, Lincoln Riley has recruited well at receiver somewhat, but still like you're going to count on what Zachariah Branch, sort of an undersized slot type guy to be a game changer defensively. They haven't recruited well. They didn't add a ton in terms of top tier talent in the front seven in the portal. The secondary has been a huge issue. I know that they've tried to upgrade the coaching staff when it's Eric Henderson from the Rams and Matt Entz from North Dakota State. Like they've put money into the coaching staff, but as they enter into the Big Ten and you look at this specific schedule, LSU and Michigan, I think early on. Yeah, LSU. Neutral site game in Vegas to open up the year. Yeah. That's a Sunday night game. Mm -hmm. At Michigan, week four. They've also got a home game against Wisconsin. They're home against Penn State. They're on the road at Washington. They're home against Nebraska late in the year. Who knows? Yeah. On the road at UCLA, close out the year at home against Notre Dame. There are losses. There are multiple losses on the schedule. Um, if if what you're saying is to be believed, now I I don't know. I feel like a broken record. We've been saying this the last couple of seasons. Like, ah, oh, they got to get better on defense. You got to get better on defense. Of course. They go out, they hire Dant Lynn. They got to get better on you defense. You need dudes. They don't but have you do dudes. Need, you do need dudes. And you need dudes that are on the field, not coaching the guys on the field. Right. They have Bear Alexander, who's really good. That's kind of it. And, to, and like, they bring in some, and, you know, I think they bring in a corner from Mississippi State, uh, maybe a running back from Mississippi State. Like, they, they're sort of adding guys here and there. But I don't see it. Penn State, Maryland, Nebraska, Nebraska's defense, UCLA, Notre Dame, I think will be an improved Wisconsin early, Michigan, LSU. I think this team has it in them to go five and seven. We had somebody who wrote in, who wrote in and said that Wisconsin's going to win the Big Ten. What's the take? That that Phil Longo is going to get the most out of Tyler Van Dyke and that it's going to be a renaissance. And he's going to what, get the South Carolina job or something after the year? <laughs> yeah, I think that, that was, was the take. A, that was a good take, yeah. I just think it's on the table for USC to go 5-7. and seven. What, Look how they finished their year last year. What is it about the USC experience right now, other than what Lincoln Riley did years ago at Oklahoma? I have no doubt in my mind Lincoln Riley can make quarterbacks better. And generate big plays on offense. But even like the receivers last year for USC, like Taj Williams, Brendan Rice, gone by the way. Like, I just think they keep taking steps back without appreciable steps forward to counterbalance. And so as they enter into the Big Ten, I think they're just going to have more losable games with less firepower. More losable games with less firepower. Yeah. I love it. Dan, I think that does it for Take a Toa, at least this episode yeah. featuring Take a Toa. Um, I believe Take a Toa's smoke burnt out my light here that I had that was illuminating Take a Toa. I heard a weird buzzing sound and then it went off. <laughs> okay. So that's something. <laughs> we'll see if it Too does hot. the same to my lungs, but Take a Toa. Yes, yes, feed me the takes. Take a toe is burning hot. Take a toe will be with us throughout the course of the season. We had somebody else send in. Please take go that. outside and air out your lungs, Ty. <laughs> this is not good for my lungs. Take a toe has been fun, though. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Appreciate everybody sending in their takes. 
solidverbal at gmail.com if you want to get yours in. We will do this periodically. Take a toe will be featured. As part of our set here, we just need to figure out where we can fit it. Yes. Frankly, it does not fit <laughs> right now. So we're, we'll work our way up to this. This whole thing was sort of thrown together, but uh, have appreciated building this new reality with you, Dan Rubenstein. Of course. This is the first entrance into our like ring of fire, right? The That's Pacific right. Rim going up and down the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. This is, this is the first part of it, and uh, we'll continue to add. We had somebody send in a take that somebody else is going to copy the volcano. Of course. It's hard to copy the volcano yeah. at this point. We had somebody else send in a take that the volcano will be featured on network television at some point. That'd which be I nice. don't think is a hot take. That would be nice. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, follow us on social media. Make sure you hit follow or subscribe wherever it is to get your podcasts. For ballers.com, of course, is where you get the bonus content, the early access to all of these episodes, ad free content, Discord, the games that we plan on playing here in the offseason and much, much more. Also, behind-the-scenes bonus coverage of me building this damn thing, <laughs> if you're ever so inclined. Yeah. Oh, boy. Sexy this eruption reality. shots. Yeah. This weird re- sexy eruption shots. There we go. We'll <laughs> leave it there. Yeah. For that guy over there, my good friend, Dan Rubenstein, for myself, Ty Hildebrandt. Thank you for joining us on this odyssey into Take a Toa. We'll catch y'all next week. Or no, we'll catch y'all soon. Stay solid. Peace.